Spring fans, welcome to another installment of Spring Tips. This week, we're going to talk about a topic that's near and dear to my heart, building better CLI applications. Wait, what? Yes, you heard me. We're going to look at building CLI applications using Spring Shell. I know. Yes, we did talk about that before. Yes, I did have a video on this years and years ago, but I love Spring Shell. And it's one of those things that's been in the Spring ecosystem in some form or another for many, many, many years. Right? Uh, I, I think that some of the original work was born out of Spring Roo, which some of you may remember from 2008 or so. Uh, and that, that experience uh, then kind of snowballed and people started using it for different projects. It was part of Spring Cloud Dataflow at some point, uh, or Spring XD. Um, we've got different, I, I think uh, uh, Spring Skipper uses it. I mean, there's just so many things that kind of use it behind the scenes and you don't even need to know about it. I'm pretty sure VMware at one point had a product that used it. Uh, I know people in the community use it. It's an amazing little project. The only bummer is that in order for it to work, because it's a JRE application, you have to ship the JRE. So we're going to revisit Spring Shell today with a twist, which is that there's now Spring Native support. <laughs> the potential, the opportunity, it's amazing. So let's dive right into it. I don't want to waste another second because this stuff is so cool. All right, let's get started. Obviously, the first thing we need to do is to use Spring Shell itself. So we're gonna create a brand new application using Spring Native. We're gonna bring Lumbuck and no Spring Shell, right? And the part of the reason is because it's not on the Spring Initializer anymore. It used to be, interestingly enough. It used to be here, it was awesome, I wish it were so. Uh, but it's not, it's okay, it's not a big deal. We'll just use Java 17. We're gonna hit generate and we're gonna open this up in our IDE as usual. Okay, our application's open. Uh, we need to add the appropriate dependency to our build. We're gonna add the, we're going to add the Spring Shell starter. All right, it's a, not yet a GA release. In fact, it's not even a milestone, it's a snapshot build. Hopefully by the time you're watching this, uh, you know, it'll be released and ready for you. Uh, but needless to say, this is the Java native uh, sort of access API version of Spring Shell. So there is a regular Spring Shell starter, but if you want some of the extra features that uh, that are enabled through native code, particularly on Windows, to work, then you need to bring in this. Um, so we're going to add that here, and then we're going to need the, um, the, the correct milestone and snapshot repositories. Let's see if that works. Okay, so it's on the class path. Everything is good. We've got Spring Native. We've got Spring Shell. Uh, we've got Lumbuck. Let's build our application. And again, I don't want to, we're not going to spend too long looking at this because it's not the most interesting part, but Spring Shell is awesome, right? So the first thing's first, you create a shell component. Uh, and here, we're going to create a shell component that, let's say, um, handles logging in, all right? And so we're going to need a login service, class login service. And here, you know, just to keep it simple, I'll have a atomic reference to the user, and uh, you know, it'll be a uh, string, and then we'll have some methods to support some common questions like is logged in, turn this dot um, user dot get, you know, um, is let's see, get does not equal null. Okay, there you go. Uh, what about logging in itself? So we can do log in string username, string password, this dot user dot set. Now this is not actual secure code, obviously. I'm just using this as a sample so that I have something stateful with which to work. Uh, void log out, this dot user dot set is null. So we're just setting and clearing the session whenever somebody logs in, this is gonna be a service. And we wanna use that from within our shell application. So we're gonna inject that in, into the constructor and I can use Java's fabulous law, uh, record syntax. I love records so very much. Um, and we're gonna create a method here. So the first method is shell method public void login, all right? And obviously I need to give this a name, so I'm gonna say login and um, String username, string password. So in order to do for this to work, these are this is going to be a tab completable action. It's going to have some parameters: dash dash username, dash dash password. In order for that to work, I need to you know expose that that prototype there. Okay, 
Uh, and now, um, I want to have a shell method to log out. So public void log out. And again, we're just delegating to the service. Oops, this dot service dot log out. Okay, not bad. Good stuff. So there's our our basic uh, login and log out. Uh, now, let's just see if that works. First of all, let's just try it out. We'll just run it locally. So we'll do uh, Maven skip tests, clean package, and Java minus jar target um, jar. Okay. It's saying that the command description cannot be null or empty. That's fair. I forgot to add this. So, start again. All right, we're, we did it. We're in the shell here. You can see that there are different commands here, and you can, uh, you, I'm not sure if you can see it on the uh, recording, but there's actually gray text. I've, I've selected it so that it becomes more clear. Uh, there's gray text giving you a prompt as to what each command does. Um, and you can see there's our login and logout commands. These other commands come pre-provided for you out of the box with Spring Shell. You can disable them. You can provide your own exit and your own clear. But why would you? You know, why wouldn't you just use this? Maybe you want to disable some of them. That's up to you. Certainly possible. Spring Shell is nothing if not imminently uh, customizable. But, um, okay, so we've got uh, our, our commands. Let's try logging in, right? Log in, hit tab. I get two different options there, great. Uh, tabs, username, it's PW, and then username is jlong. All right, good. What about log out? I guess that'll work, right? So, so there we go. So both worked, but nothing really, as far as the user is concerned at least, nothing has really happened, right? There's no prompts, there's no state, there's no visibility into what we're doing. It's just very sort of dry. We've got no confirmation. We should have printed something out. We didn't do anything, really. Um, and so one thing you can do is to create, a, a, you know, availability prompts or availability um, indicators that tell Spring Shell how to surface certain commands. So, for example, logout. It makes no sense to support logging out until after they've logged in, right? Fair enough. So we're going to create an availability for logout availability. And I'm going to say return this.service.isLoggedIn. Uh, avail it's availability dot available, availability dot unavailable, right? You must be logged in, yeah? So this is my very simple log of, uh, availability, and it'll work by, de by default, by uh, convention. So if the shell method is log out, then so too will the availability method be log out availability. You can be explicit about that. You can say shell uh, method availability is log out availability, right? And that'll work as well if we want to be very explicit about what is tied to what. This is one option. Another thing that we might want to do is to change the prompt, right? When we ran the uh, application, the username was in yellow, right? And that's a kind of a neutral color. It doesn't tell us really much of anything, does it? it? Our application is in a state where you can't go, you can't stop, you know? I don't know. It's just very mm, ambivalent, right? So what we want is to indicate based on the state of the uh, application, the business logic, whether uh, the user should log in, whether they're in a bad state or, or a good state or whatever. We're gonna create a login prompt provider. A prompt provider is not a provider that's on time. It's a provider that provides prompts that get shown on the command line, prompting the user to do something. So let's create a record. Uh, we're gonna call this the login prompt provider. It'll use the login service. It'll use the login service and it's going to implement prompt provider. And this method, okay, let's return a uh, attributed string. So we have two different cases here, right? Um, logged equals uh, new attributed string. And the login service dot, you know, we need the, we need the actual current user. So, uh, Let's think about this string logged in user, return this dot user dot get and logged in user. And then we want to give it some colors and maybe we want to you know, customize this as well. So I'll say like that, 
And then we want to say attributed style default, but we don't want default. We want to default dot. Uh, we, want the, we want the default uh, background, but the foreground we want to be, you know, some other color that's very hostile and jarring. I, green, no, we want red, right? Okay, so that's. Oh no, that's green. We want green. If you're logged in, it's green, right? Um, but. What if you're not, right? Okay, so let's see what's wrong with this. Uh, we want that bar not logged in, right? So logged in, not logged in, new attributed string, um, unknown. Okay, we want that new, and then we want attributed style dot uh, default foreground attributed style, let's say, red. Okay, so these are the two choices and we can say, okay, return this.loginservice.isLoggedIn. Okay, logged in. Otherwise, not logged in, right? Pretty simple. And we don't need that, good. So there's our prompt, we're saying, show the current user with green, otherwise show the unknown user. Right, uh, and you know, technically, I could take advantage of short circuit evaluation. So this would be, this would prevent the creation, the unnecessary creation of the object for at least one of those cases, which is a good idea if this has any side effects. Uh, but um, you don't have to, strictly speaking, right? It's fine. Okay, and by the way, I think I mean if you if you look right, this could just be a lambda. Yeah, it's a lambda. It could easily be a lambda. This is not a very hard thing uh, to create. You could do that. Um, okay, so we've got our prompt. Let's go ahead and run this application again. Exit, take advantage of one of the built-ins, and rebuild. All right, there we go. So we're logged in, and you can see it's very unhappy with us, right? So, okay, what do we do? Well, we should log in, it looks like. Okay, we have to provide a username and password. Jlong, password, PW. And there we go, Jlong, green letters. All right, so now it's working. And we can try logging out, right? Goes back to that. And if we log out again, by the way, what happens there? Well, we've got the availability prompt. So it says it exists, but it doesn't, it's not available because you have to be logged in. Good stuff. I like this. The only problem is that, you know, and this is almost never a problem, but the problem here is that we've got all this logging, which is great on the server side, but for the, you know, when, for an end user binary, maybe you want to quiet this down a little bit. And yes, maybe you even want to like take out the, um, the banner, you know, I don't know. Uh, what we're gonna do, there's a couple ways to do this. You could log levels root equals off, and then the banner equals off. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and rebuild it. Recycle. All right, so let me just start from zero. So Java minus jar target shell. So this is where the, the program starts and ta-da, we're in the application. You wouldn't know that there's a Spring Boot application behind the scenes there. Uh, and in fact, you could build an, an executable application, right? I had to use Java minus jar for this, um, but you could easily just use executable jars. Okay, so in this case, rebuild, executable is true. Okay, so there's the uh, the uh, endpoint. Let's exit cd target, and now notice I've got my jar. I can just do shell, ta-da, and it spins up, right? I don't have to I don't have to um, run Java minus jar. The problem is um, that it still requires a JRE, right? This is supposed to be like an end user client, uh, and you, you it's hard to distribute a full JRE, uh, and there's legal implications, by the way. You gotta make sure you package the right one. I'm not sure you can just take a regular like Oracle JDK and package it up. You have to go through the right channels. You might have to use JLink. I, I don't purport to know. I'm definitely not a lawyer. Don't listen to me for anything. But um, all I know is that packaging up a JRE is a good way to do something wrong if you're not careful. So uh, you, that's not great. Plus, it's just a pain, right? I mean, you, we've all dealt with CLIs that uh, bundle runtimes, right? And it's not great. It's fragile. 
the vendor ends up having to ship the whole runtime just to make sure. Uh, there's some major cloud vendors out there uh, that have used, uh, for example, Ruby and Python because they are imminently scriptable. They do a good job. The problem is that they're just very bad choices for end user deployments. Uh, and so, for example, the original Cloud Foundry CLI was written on Ruby, uh, but Ruby is very finicky. You know, at the time it was like, if you're using Ruby 1.8 versus 1.9, it's night and day difference. They don't work to together. Um, we, we since switched that to Go. Statically linked, you could just deploy binaries. You know, we lost the benefit of having one binary that could run across multiple operating systems, but that wasn't really a benefit that we cared about anyway, right? Like it was, because we still had to download the, the Ruby runtime and it was just a pain in the patoot to, to do that. Uh, other cloud vendors, even today, they use Python uh, for their CLIs, which is fine. But again, you know, if you're, for example, if you're using Mac, the, the default, when you, when you use uh, Python, P-Y-T-H-O-N, uh, it's using Python 2X, which is, more than 10 years since past its prime, you know, it's, it's woefully inadequate um, and antiquated. So, uh, so all the different vendors have to make sure to package the correct version of Python and that, that can lead to confusion. So all that to say, packaging a runtime for your CLIs, it can be done, but why would you want to do it, right? It's much easier in this day and age just to, when somebody logs into your page on Mac, you give them the Mac binary. When they log into your web page on Linux, you give them the Linux binary. When they log into it on Windows, you give them the Windows binary. And if they're on something else and you don't have a pre-built native binary, statically linked self-contained native binary for them, then just use the Java version, right? At that point, it's fine to say, hey, we've got something that nobody else has, which is our binary runs everywhere. It just runs better uh, in these three operating systems. It's not like a complete all or nothing. It either is or isn't, right? Um, and so you can get that with GraalVM, right? With GraalVM native images and Spring native. And we, we're gonna make that work. We're gonna use Spring Shell uh, and make that work in a native context. Um, but in order to do that, we need to add a hint class, a native configuration class that I'm gonna call, I'm gonna put in a package called nativex and I'm just gonna call it shell native configuration. But basically um, it's a type that uses the Spring AOT support. So I have to add that to the class path. Okay, AOT. Okay, Spring AOT, reload. And once that's on the class path, we get this extension interface. These types were created uh, mostly for Windows, my friend Yanni uh, explains. Yanni is of course one of the uh, string of amazing people that have worked on, contributed to, and made better the uh, Spring Shell project over the many years of, ex of its existence. Um, and so he says these are mostly for Windows. You can see trace clues to that effect about uh, Win32, x86, 64, JNI dispatch.tll, and uh, you know things like that. There's various types in here that are in JNA that are using, uh, that are for kernel 32, Win, you know, it's Win32 basically. Um, so these types mostly, but I suspect some of them must be for other operating systems, I don't know. It doesn't all that much matter. I'm not gonna. I don't have Windows. I don't use Windows. I'm sure it's great. I, I just. I just haven't gotten around to installing it recently in the last 20 years. So, um, this is a hints class, and uh, it's for JNA. JNA is one of the three uh, choices that a Java developer, a JVM developer, has at their disposal for connecting to native code, right? For writing code that talks to the POSIX API or to the Win32 API or to the, uh, you know. BSD, mock kernel, or whatever. I mean, uh, all these different um, uh, operating systems have all sorts of cool stuff that they can do. You have three choices today if you want. You can use JNI, which is a, a dog's breakfast, but it does kind of work if you're willing to slog through it. There's JNA, which is dynamic dispatch against native code, which is more like what the foreign function interfaces from other languages does. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the upcoming Project Panama, which I can't wait for. And it looks to have sort of the best of, best of both JNA and JNI. Um, it's neither here nor there, we don't care. All you gotta know is that there's a bunch of stuff here for JNA, and when we brought in the Spring Shell dependency, we brought in the JNA prefixed, or rather suffixed version of that dependency, okay? All right, so we have to register this type, right? Spring doesn't find it as a regular Spring Bean. This gets put into the service loader, the same service loader you use for Spring Boot auto configuration. So meta inf, and then a new file, spring.factories. Okay, and we're gonna get a full reference to this. And this, copy, reference. All right. So there's our 
na native configuration and the shell native configuration. There's a, all that. And with that, I think we're ready to compile. So let's go to the command line and we'll compile it. So let's go to the command line and we'll compile it. Okay, cd shell uh, maven p native d skip tests clean package. Now, this is going to take a minute, so we'll just let it do its thing and I'll talk to you on the other side of the jump. All right, so it's finished its build. Let's go to the target directory and there's our shell application. Let's run it. Ta-da, there's our application. Log in, username, jlong, pw, there we are. So we've got our application, we've got some options there, we can look at the version, not bad, huh? We can exit, that's a native application. Actually, if we start it again, and then log back into the same machine, pgrep shell, you can see there's our pid, I'm gonna get the memory of that, right? RSS by pid. You can see the application is taking 39 megabytes of RAM. So trivial, right? Small, that includes everything needed to run the application on this architecture, which in my case is an Intel MacBook Pro, an Intel uh, Apple device. GraalVM doesn't, as far as I know, support GA uh, M1 builds. That is, I understand it and oh, I sure hope uh, is uh, being worked on but uh, it's not yet there. So I've been building these things on my Intel Mac. I've been writing the code on my M1, uh, my Apple M1, so I'm just SSHing into the Intel Mac. There's a reason that thing's still there, right? It's so I can run these uh, GraalVM builds every now and then. This is a GitHub action that will automatically set up whatever version of GraalVM and whatever version of the Java syntax you want. Its e use is super easy, right? You can specify uh, the, the utilities, the components you want, including this, the native image component. Uh, the tool. You want the GitHub token to avoid rate limiting issues. Uh, you want Java 11 support. I want Java 17 because it's the right thing to do uh, in 2022. Um, and uh, and so on. So I uh, this is already half the battle. GitHub Actions also supports something called a matrix compilation where you can say for every permutation or from, for every element in each of these different dimensions, create a, a compilation. So if I have, you know, two different versions of GraalVM across Three different operating systems, uh, then I might have you know uh, two times three output targets, right? In this case, I just want to compile on Mac and on Linux, right? I suppose I could do Windows, but I haven't really tried it yet, and I'm a little bit embarrassed to say I don't know what'll happen. Um, but yeah, let's just say I want to do Mac and Linux. I can set up my own build for the application. Uh, here's the code. It's on Spring Tips as usual. GitHub.com uh, forward slash Spring hyphen Tips Spring Shell Native, and there's the workflows directory. GitHub workflows. And you can see that this build actually does exactly that. It's whenever somebody sends a push or a pull request, it kicks off it, you know, zero to n jobs. Here's one job called build. The name is keyed on the version that we're using and the, the operating system. I'm gonna run it on the operating system. The operating system has two permutations. There's also a Windows latest you, you could use. Here's the version of GraalVM that I wanna use. So I've got, you know, it'll, go, it'll do once on macOS and once on Ubuntu for this version. It would do once for both versions on each operating system if there were more than one version. And if there were three operating systems, then you know you can you can see what's happening, all right? It's gonna cross them. Uh, and then, you know, it's just a regular job. I'm gonna check out the code. I'm gonna use the GraalVM GitHub action to set up GraalVM. Then I'm gonna build the build. And I'm using the uh, if statement here. And obviously in this case, it would work, uh, I think. You know, Maven is, as far as, as, far as I know, it works just fine on, uh, on Windows. There's no, nothing special there. So. This isn't really needed, but if you had some command or something that you wanted to do to prepare the binary on Windows for Windows users in a way that uh, you know you can't do with this, then you could have a stanza that says if runner.os equals Windows, then run some commands, you know, including the Maven clean package. Uh, but if it's but and then what if it's if it's on Unix like in this, this is this is basically uh, the non-Windows versions, right? I don't have Windows in the matrix, but if I did, this would be Mac and Ubuntu, right? So for those Unix Unix N type uh, distributions, this would be very interesting as well. And then finally, we can upload the binary uh, to the GitHub artifacts page, right? So I've actually, uh, you know, that takes like 10 minutes. So I'm not gonna sit, sit here and work through all of that right now, but you can see I've already done this before, Mac OS and Ubuntu latest. I can click on the summary, right? And when I see that, I get my, I got a shell Mac OS latest and 
shell Ubuntu latest. And there, there's a discrepancy in the binary size. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the size of the headers on different operating systems. Who's to say? Who's to know? Um, I can run the Mac one. We've already seen that that works. And in fact, I think this would probably work. The Mac one would probably work on my M1, if nothing else, through uh, Rosetta, right? What's more interesting is this Ubuntu. So let's download that. I can do docker run it Ubuntu bash. Okay, and you can see this is the container ID. So I want to get that binary into that container. Um, let's get back into that. And so I'll say uh, docker cp desktop. Desktop shell Ubuntu, right? There's that. So I'm going to say docker cp uh, and then like that. All right, so now I'm inside this Docker image and there should be a shell application in here somewhere. There it is, shell Ubuntu. And I can come, I can do shmod ax to make it executable and then run it. Ta-da! So now I can do login, username, jlong, password, pw, get all my state back, do logout, no problem, logout again. Problem, of course, because of the availability prompt. So all that just works, and it works on Linux, it works on Mac, and it probably works on Windows. Uh, you know, a little bit more exploration is certainly merited there. Now, obviously, we've just begun to scratch the surface of what's possible, both with Spring Shell and uh, Spring Native. You can have great looking uh, console applications that have lots of really intuitive functionality that make it easy to build the kind of rich experiences uh, that our shells so sorely deserve. You know, uh, it's it's a shame that we focus so much on user interfaces when we and then we neglect the original user interface, the CLI, you know? So uh, I hope you get something out of this. There's a lot of potential here, obviously. And remember, we're inside of Spring Native. You're in Spring. You can do anything that Spring is doing. So obviously Spring Shell is just the beginning. But imagine you, you want to have an application so that people can calculate some sort of report or whatever, kick off a Spring Batch job, run it on your local machine, use H2 embedded so you can have a little SQL database in the shell application. Nobody will ever know because all they'll have is shell, the binary, self-contained, statically linked. You can embed H2 there, right? Um, you could do messaging. You could actually have a thing that uses Spring integration and monitors a directory. And then whenever that new file shows up, this native app, which you could install as a daemon if you wanted, right? Uh, in your operating system, it could do something interesting with that. Uh, you could talk to MQTT. You could do all sorts of things, and of course you can ship a shell all in native, right? All this doesn't have to be on the server side. Obviously Spring is well known and very successful in the server side, uh, on the server side, but I'm just saying there's some really interesting opportunities here. Um, if this client wants to speak OAuth, it can, right? It can, it's Spring, it has access to Spring security and all that. You can make reactive non-blocking HTTP calls using the, the web client. The sky's the limit here, my friends.